about what can be done about tax water closures, not only the Doug administration, but the, the county. Uh, and in other places, people do very innovative things uh, to keep people in their homes, and the very exact opposite is being done here. And man, I'm sweating babies. So I'm gonna uh, hand the mic off to Jackson. Everyone, if we could give them a, a warm welcome, I'd appreciate it. All right, thanks, David, and hi, everybody. I think that um, I'm going to keep the spirit of the circle, maybe, unless y'all think I should stand. Is there a preference? All right, we'll, we'll treat this like a panel and uh, sit here. Um, so I, uh, what I want to talk about today is kind of myth and reality about where Detroit's blight and abandonment came from. So if you ask anybody around the city why there are so many abandoned properties, urban prairies, uh, what, what are they likely to tell you? What are some common things that the people hear? Unemployment. Unemployment, okay. Wife flight. What's that? Wife flight. Wife flight, uh huh. Right. And then what's, it's the 50th anniversary of what this year? The rebellion. The rebellion, right? So a lot of people will say, you know, deindustrialization, wife flight, job losses, um, and, you know, the riots. So the riots happened, whites left, and then there was nobody to fill up all the houses. Uh, and so this is kind of a myth that I want to bust today. I'm going to talk about a federal housing program in the 1970s that actually led to uh, much of the destruction of Detroit's housing stock uh, that we're still dealing with today. And then I'll kind of bring it forward and talk about the uh, 2008 housing crisis, or the crisis that began in 2008 but still ongoing, and talk about how those two, two things are related. So, how did Detroit's abandonment problem get so bad? There's myth and reality. And so the myth that I said, you know, was that a thousand, what, you're, what you're likely to hear if you ask folks around the city is that thousands of structures were burned, vandalized, abandoned, and destroyed as a result of the 1967 rebellion. Uh, so then white flight accelerated, jobs left with white folks, and there was too much land and too few people, right? So in a way, this isn't untrue. Uh, Detroit experienced rapid deindustrialization after World War II, uh, massive white flight, and there was property destruction that took place during the rebellion. Uh, you'll see in the New York Times, a uh, New York Times story in 2013 called An Anatomy of Detroit's Decline. They said, as the migration of blacks who swept into Detroit became especially intense, middle-class whites began moving to the newly built suburbs. But violent 1967 riots turned the stream into a torrent. And after the riots, Detroit failed to bounce back. Businesses followed their customers. Thousands of houses were abandoned and the city's population plunged. So this is really the mainstream narrative about what happened to Detroit. We're all very familiar with this, right? So what actually happened during the rebellion? How many properties were, were destroyed? About 2,500. There was still a severe housing shortage in the city at this time despite population declines between 1950 and 1970. So over 300,000 people left Detroit between World War II and the 1967 rebellion. Uh, yet the city wasn't experiencing this mass abandonment uh, problem, right, that, that is blamed on white flight and on the rebellion. The reality is that a federal program called Section 235 of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So this was a key piece of civil rights legislation in the 1960s. Um, insured risky mortgages in the inner city in an attempt to reverse decades of redlining. And so, uh, just a quick comment about what redlining is here. Um, Tom Segrew's book in, in 1996 talked a lot about this, and, and Ken Jackson's book on, on suburbanization. But, uh, and during the New Deal, the federal government decided to stimulate the economy by creating the 30-year mortgage. And it created the 30-year mortgage by insuring banks to lend to uh, lower and lower income folks. So prior to that point, you could get a mortgage on an $8,000 house, you might have to put uh, five grand down on it, right? And your mortgage might only be three to five years. Uh, but during the New Deal, the federal government backed mortgages for, that were uh, for 30 years that banks made, so they you know mitigated the risk. Um, and in doing that, though, they decided which areas banks that they would that they would insure those bank loans and which areas they would not. So they didn't want to insure loans 
in areas that were too risky. And so some of the, some of the things that uh, determined risk for the federal government in 1934 uh, was the age of housing stock, right? So they didn't want to insure property that was too old. Uh, they preferred to insure uh, mortgages in new subdivisions, right? Uh, but a really key factor was race. So if there was any level of racial mixture in a neighborhood, it got a D rating. So A was the best, and then there's B, C, and D was do not invest, right? So if there's any level of racial mixture in a neighborhood, it got a D rating. So here's a map of Detroit. You can see from uh, 1939, you see all the areas that are redlined. Uh, the blue is the second best, green is the best, blue is the second best, uh, yellow is the third, and then red areas are all these do not invest numbers. So the point of section 235 uh, was to ensure loans in these risky areas in the inner city that had been redlined for 40 years, right? So it was reverse redlining. The, the government was saying, we need to back more in these areas, create more homeowners, um, and then that will revitalize these areas. So we're talking about places like Lower East Side, uh, Northwest Goldberg, these areas in the nor near Northwest Side, the near West Side, these neighborhoods that are ring downtown, right? So this uh, federal program ran from 1968 to 1973, and uh, there was massive mismanagement and corruption, it led to widespread fraud and foreclosure as speculators uh, sold low quality homes to subsidize buyers at inflated prices and then those buyers foreclosed. So how many properties were destroyed through this program from 1968 to 1973? About 25,000. And that's just in Detroit. So we have 2,500 properties that were destroyed during the 1967 rebellion. as a direct result, right? Because um, we know that these things sort of carry on and have effects that uh, ripple outward, but about 2,500 properties and then 25,000 uh, were destroyed as a direct result of this federal program. So, a bit more on Section 235. Uh, it, was, it was a shift in minority housing policy from public housing to home ownership su subsidies for the first time. So previously, the federal government, FHA, Federal Housing Administration, would back mortgages pretty much for whites only. And then this was a, uh, and then public housing, very small amounts, right, were built in the inner city as part of urban renewal programs. And this was a shift in that, um, saying that the federal government was now going to back mortgages for minorities in the inner city. Uh, it was also a shift, it's important that it was a shift away from public housing and towards home ownership, right? So this is right before Richard Nixon impounds funds for social programs, right? Um, and, and makes the transition from direct federal grants to cities to block grants. So all of these things are happening at the same time um, as mass deindustrialization, white, white flight, and all of this. So Section 235 did two things. It ensured these mortgages in redlined areas, um, and it also subsidized mortgage rates and payments to enable low-income families to purchase a home. So there was this housing and urban development component uh, where the mortgages were subsidized, and then there was the FHA component, the Federal Housing Administration, which ensured the mortgage. So Beryl Satter says, uh, she's actually in residence until tomorrow, I think, she's going back to New York. Uh, she said in a, in a 2009 article, she's a historian, that in, 19, in the 1970s, minority communities that were vulnerable because of decades of state-sanctioned racial discrimination and the granting of credit were suddenly promised a chance at home ownership through this program, right? But unfortunately, African Americans were instead entrapped in predatory loans, loans designed not to enable home ownership, but to ensnare the borrower in the highest possible debt, thereby enriching the lender. So that begs the question, what went wrong? I mean, this sounds good, right? Like, the, the federal government has excluded African Americans and most other non-white groups from obtaining 30-year mortgages by refusing to insure those mortgages for 45 years. So now it wants to reverse that trend and back mortgages in the inner city and for uh, racial minorities who wish to live either in the inner city or elsewhere. So it sounds like a good idea, um, but it played out rather interestingly. So the first, the first thing that happened is that speculators took the lead. And this sounds familiar, I'm sure. Uh, speculators swooped into Detroit and other cities uh, and started buying up slum properties in, with the expectation, right, that, that then low-income buyers would be able to come in and buy these properties with a federally-backed loan. 
So speculators came in and bought the properties, then they bribed FHA officials to uh, artificially inflate the appraisals of homes. So a common inflation was about 400%. So if someone came in and bought a house, or if, if a speculator bought a house for $5,000, uh, they could then turn that around for $20,000 to an unsuspecting low-income buyer. Uh, and the government would back the loan so the bank would make the loan. So homes sold uh, also that failed inspections. So that there was fraud and corruption in the, in the sense that uh, FHA officials were being bribed to artificially appraise the value of the home. And then they also failed to, HUD failed to inspect the home. So not only were the, was the value of the home inflated, but folks would move in to homes that were supposed to be livable under the stipulations of the law, but which had holes in the floor, uh, broken windows, right? Um, a number of problems. And so then they were stuck. Now they're a homeowner, right? They're not living in public housing, they're a homeowner. So now they're on the hook for all of these repairs. So then the banks, they knew that they would be paid whether the homeowner defaulted or not, so they made the loans, right? Because normally a bank would say, hey, that house is only worth $5,000. Why would you, why would I give you a loan for $20,000 for that house? Like we all experience this, you know, when you go to buy a car or anything. Um, but they knew that they were gonna be paid, so they made these loans. Then another thing that happened, so of course we, we have this mass foreclosure that, start, that begins to take place as soon as the program begins. Um, but what it also did is that it created a backlog in the processing of foreclosures. So Section 235 foreclosures were skyrocketing. So then uh, FHA and, and others were no longer able to process traditional foreclosures. So what that meant is that traditional foreclosures that were taking place in the city sat. The home sat vacant, right, while these things were being processed. And we all know what that looks like in Detroit when when a bank takes, takes two years to process a foreclosure or to, to flip a home after an eviction, what happens, right? The home gets scrapped, the elements start to take over, the pipes freeze, um, there might be squatters, right? And so this started to happen as all foreclosures in the city were piled up and, and weren't being sort of resold and flipped to investors or homeowners. So, this also sounds a little bit familiar. Uh, the FHA ended up paying, so they were paying, right, when a homeowner defaulted, the bank gets the home, and then the government would buy that home from the bank, right, because they were backing that loan. So the FHA paid nearly $200 million in insurance payouts to Detroit banks due to mortgage defaults under the Section 235 program. So the banks got bailed out. Do you think the homeowners got bailed out? No, right? So that's just kind of a, a broad overview of the Section 235 program. There are a lot of people doing really good work on this right now. Um, and what they're doing is they're really uncovering this from, it's a hidden history, right? So we think about the 1970s as just sort of dealing with the consequences of deindustrialization, dealing with the consequences of the rebellion, dealing with the consequences of the white flight. But the city was actually a really vibrant place that was being governed, and it was being governed poorly at multiple levels of government. Right? Um, so we have the federal government stepping in with this program and, and really destroying about 25,000 properties throughout the city. Um, and so, so what happens at this time is that uh, Nixon, the Nixon administration begins to use the failure. So there were, there were news articles coming out about all the foreclosures and all the problems with Section 235. And so Nixon uses an excuse to say, well, see, it's another social program that doesn't work. And there was a moratorium on all housing subsidies in 1973. So community activists in Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland were calling for safeguards, right, and an end to the corruption for an otherwise uh, pretty good program that folks were taking advantage of. Um, and, and instead, the program was just cut. So that happens in 1973. Um, so it was... I'm going to talk a little bit. How am I doing on time, David? I'm just going to I'm going to zoom up a little bit to uh, how it's similar to the 2008 crisis and, and how it's different. So it was similar in that fair lending was used as a justification to expand the mortgage market further into low-income communities, um, and the federal government subsidized that expansion in various ways by bailing, including by bailing out the banks after everybody lost their homes. So that's pretty similar. 
after what happened in both crises. Subprime, the expansion of subprime lending was justified on the basis that it would bring more minorities into home ownership and that they could build wealth. Uh, it was also similar in that the financial industry made trillions of dollars off of it, um, and off of working class racial minorities who never received any such bailout or justice or reparations for what happened. Like the FHA and the HUD scandal, the subprime crisis targeted black home, home, home buyers regardless of income. Uh, Detroit's, in, in the subprime crisis, Detroit's upper income blacks were more than twice as likely to receive high cost subprime loans than low income whites in the years leading up to the crisis. So I'll repeat that. High income blacks were twice as likely to receive subprime rates on their loans, high cost loans, than low income whites. Um, and that's in, in Detroit, but it, it happened all over the country. So uh, subprime lending skyrocketed after deregulation, which is a little different. So Section 235 was a federal program. Uh, and subprime lending really took off after uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which made it impossible for banks to sell your mortgage out on Wall Street, right? So when, you, when they sell your mortgage, the bank no longer absorbs the risk, which is what happened in Section 235. Um, so, so in the years after that repeal, subprime lending increased sixfold, um, over $600 trillion. And uh, Detroit was the second most lucrative area for subprime lending in the United States. McAllen, Texas was the first, and then it's a city of, I'm not sure, it's a, it's a pretty small city. Um, but Detroit was the second highest area where 48% of the mortgages in 2006 were subprime. So these, these subprime mortgages went mostly to blacks and Latinos, regardless of their income. Um, and so the Detroit News has reported that between 2000 and 2015, there were more than 65,000 mortgage foreclosures in Detroit. So we've got 25,000 uh, properties destroyed through, through blight and abandonment during Section 235. We've got 65,000 foreclosures in Detroit as a result of the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, and 56% of those foreclosures are blighted or abandoned. Uh, so this, this brought the number of blighted and abandoned properties as a direct result of those two crises, and the crises to almost 60,000. Um, this, you know, of course, the demolitions, there was, the city was intended in 2015 to demolish 13,000 homes at a cost of $195 million. So, the second, and I'm going to close out with this, the second foreclosure crisis was different, though, in a couple of really important ways. Um, first, there wasn't an FHA guarantee. So, the banks? The banks didn't know they were going to get bailed out, right? Um, whereas with Section 235, they knew in advance, and so it sort of created this, this system of widespread corruption, right? Um, whereas this time there was a little bit of, of ignorance about what was really going to happen with all of these subprime loans, um, at least on the part of the investors. So what's, you know, what's sinister about 235 is that um, folks knew what was going on. So the other difference, I think, between the recent housing crisis is the wear of it. So the first crisis happened in a lot of these inner neighborhoods ringing downtown that we've known as having lots of light and abandonment for some time, right? I remember at the 40th anniversary of the rebellion, we were having lots of conversations about light and abandonment. What were we talking about? We were talking about the Lower East Side um, and uh, the Near West Side, a lot of those areas. Uh, but the subprime crisis really gutted what I call in my work the black outer city. So these are areas that are inside the city limits and sort of subject to all of this. Um, but they're these sort of suburban areas with high rates of home ownership, right? So areas like Morningside, Bagley, East English Village, um, neighborhoods like that. So that's where the, the second subprime crisis really hit. And you can see in this map here, I don't know how clear it is on the screen, but uh, the top map is of, of subprime loans, uh, the rate of subprime loans that were issued, and the second map is blighted and abandoned foreclosures. So there's obviously a very strong correlation between the two, and the darker parts of the map are really where the second crisis hit, right? Whereas the lighter parts in the inner city were already hit by Section 235. Um, so just, you know, in closing, I think that it's really important that we bring this history to light um, particularly this year in the 50th anniversary of the rebellion because in Detroit, I, I feel like we have a bit of a, a structural victimhood complex, right? Like where we're always saying like deindustrialization, globalization, and, uh, you know, white flight, these abstract concepts that act on the city, but we need to constantly remember that these are policies uh, and decisions that were made that 
gave us the city that we've inherited today. Um, and, you know, just as the subprime crisis that we've gone through recently was a, a, a product of bad decisions um, and, and off of profiting off of uh, minorities in the city, so too with Section 235. So I'm just hoping that, you know, with this overview, uh, y'all can start thinking the 1970s more as uh, it's a more dynamic place where some really important things were happening here, but also in Chicago and Cleveland and, and Brooklyn, right? Um, there was a 500 count indictment against several FHA officials and realtors in Brooklyn as a result of Section 235. So people really went to jail over this. Um, which is also something that's different about the, the recent crisis, but yeah, so I'll um, hand it off to Gene at this, this point. I'd like to first acknowledge uh, a couple of individuals in this room that are, are really key. First of all, uh, President of the Detroit Association of Realtors, Lolita Haley. <laughs> and also my ex-professor, David Rambeau, for my people, Concept East. I want to thank you both for being here. But I'd like to open with uh, the book that was previously referenced by my colleague, by Professor Sergu, who says, quite succinctly, and perhaps more eloquently than any of us, just what's happening right now. It is dangerous to let our optimism about urban revitalization obscure the grim realities that still face most urban residents particularly people of color, acres of rundown houses, abandoned factories, vacant lots, and shuttered stores stand untended in the shadow of a revitalized downtown and hip urban enclaves. There has been very little trickle down from downtown revitalization and neighborhood gentrification to the long-term poor, the urban working class and minorities an influx of coffee shops, bistros, art galleries, and upscale boutiques have made many parts of many cities increasingly appealing for the privilege, but they have not, in any significant way, altered the everyday misery and impoverishment that characterize many urban neighborhoods. Redevelopment projects, those that have attracted the lion's share of tax subsidies and public investment, have left places like Santa Rosa and Shelfont, his old neighborhood, untouched. Little state, city, state, or federal money goes into fixing up rundown neighborhood shopping districts, and despite some conspicuous successes, often against formidable odds, community development corporations have made only a small dent in the urban economies and housing markets. Local nonprofits have the will, but ultimately not the capacity to stem the large process of capital flight that have devastated the city. He made that comment in January of 2005. So you see, what's happening now goes before Duggan, before Bing, even really before Kilpatrick. But let me give just a quick overview of some of the things that I've done uh, as a researcher, a researcher for Detroit City Council, and also as a, as a realtor uh, for the last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, to kind of bring us up to speed on where we are now. And I'm gonna make my remarks short because I'm really interested in Q and A uh, to get into the particulars uh, dig a little deeper on, on, on what has happened. In 1983, as a result of the crises that my colleagues already outlined, Detroit City Council uh, 
passed unanimously an ordinance known as 7-97, Chapter 14, Article 10, which was popularly known as the Nuisance Abatement Repair to Own Ordinance, not to be considered with the Nuisance Abatement that our present mayor bought from the county, which is basically uh, just a program for the taking of property of poor people. Under the nuisance abatement ordinance, a nuisance abatement contractor who was committed to live in the property for three years following a, a three year period of being able to bring the property back up to code. The properties that, that were eligible for the program were vacant and open to trust back. Structurally sound, tax delinquent, and a blight on the community, whether it was privately owned or publicly owned. We've done some research on this ordinance, and it's been challenged in court several times, but never successfully. Now, when I was on the city council, Mayor Young was really not particularly fond of this ordinance. That was because he still viewed development in large terms of things like new factories, uh, stadiums, big development projects that were driven by big dollars. And that was why he made the compromise when he became mayor. Uh, a proposal that was known as Proposal H to give him a strong, firm hand to end discrimination, uh, not only in city departments uh, across the city, but especially in the police department. But as a result of this compromise, there were created uh, two entities that are still with us today. Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, uh, which we used to joke with city council was, our answer to the Holy Roman Empire. And also the Downtown Development Authority, which is a tax increment finance area. Now what's meant by that is that any of the taxes that are generated inside a TIFA stay in the TIFA and can't be spent in the rest of the city, even though uh, the bonds that are raised and the taxes that are generated from the rest of the city go to support uh, large development projects inside of the DDA. Now the Young Administration, as I said, did not really support this ordinance, but never took any action in a significant way to evict uh, people from properties that they tried to set up urban homestead. Uh, during my last year at the city council, uh, we were able to force uh, the Archer administration uh, to accept a number of nuisance abatement contractors, but they kept running into two problems specifically. Problem one, they would get into a property, uh, fix it up within the three-year period, it would pass code, but the city never delivered marketable title. They gave them instead a quick claim deed, which is about as valuable as a half a roll of toilet paper. So what would happen was that the old owner in the chain of title would come back, see his property fixed up, evict the nuisance of paper contractors, or try to treat them as tenants, and, and so those people lost those properties. Now what was supposed to happen under the terms of the ordinance was that the city law department, in cases like that, was supposed to uh, represent the nuisance abatement contractor to make sure that they were reimbursed for the cost and the time and the sweat equity they had put in the property to bring it back. Well, this never happened. 
The other major problem was often a nuisance abatement contractor would get into a property and find, only to find that his, his or her resources and sweat equity was not enough to bring the property back up to code where it would pass inspection. Uh, uh, and anybody who's done home repair in a significant way knows you, sometimes you don't find out what real problems are into a house until you actually get in and try to do the work properly. When I left city council, and the last job I had there was uh, as a uh, director facilitator of the Global Trade Task Force, charged uh, by ordinance uh, to fulfill uh, a section of the empowerment zone, I don't know if people remember that, known as World Trade Expansion Initiatives, which was benchmarked to create 50 new import-export businesses, uh, particularly in markets in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, that would have been eligible for export credits from the Import-Export Bank. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that program was never funded. A lot of stuff behind that. We'll get to that later. But to, to jump to where uh, we are now, in terms of uh, my participation in the Detroit Association of Realtors, uh, particularly the Government Affairs Committee, uh, we began lobbying uh, both in Lansing and Detroit and in Washington uh, to bring back unused portions of the empowerment zone uh, tax credits, wage credits, uh, and empowerment zone bonds in order to apply them to the nuisance abatement repair to home program with the realtors filling in the gaps that the city was unable uh, to perform. And the city has not had that capacity really uh, for over 20 years. Uh, particularly in terms of clearing titles, which is something uh, realtors do as a matter of course. And also uh, getting people who moved into those houses the kind of assistance, both public and private, that they would be able to obtain once they had ownership. Our association, both national, state, and city, continues to believe that home ownership is the greatest path to a middle class lifestyle. Or as one of the former presidents of the National Association of Realtors said, when the housing crisis first started, if the American dream of home ownership is dead, then our profession is finished. To get back to where we are today, six and a half years ago, our association petitioned the city council uh, for a hearing as to how we could improve, uh, redress, and implement this ordinance, which is still on the books. The city has not implemented it in over 12 years. We had hearings uh, uh, before city council. Uh, the mayor and, and the city council eventually forced Mayor Bing to convene a working group made up of of uh, affected city departments, building and safety, planning, development, law department, etc., as well as a, a, a panel from the Detroit Association of Realtors to iron out how we could implement the ordinance successfully and make property owners out of, of, of people who have been victimized by the latest mortgage foreclosure, collateralized debt obligation, etc., tar bailout for the bank's problem. Up until early, no, late 2012, early 2013, we were still meeting with the city when the city went into a consent agreement that eventually led to the emergency manager, which led to the bankruptcy, which led to the grand bargain, or as some people call it, the grand theft bargain where the city is now run by a financial review commission. Make no mistake, 
The, your mayor and your city council do not run this city. It is run by the Financial Review Commission, set up by the governor and the emergency manager before he left, not only to oversee spending by the city, but, and now also by the Detroit Public Schools, but to control policy, to set revenue targets in every department that had anything to do with collecting fees or monies that they had to meet by hook or crook. And that is why, uh, despite what Councilmember Joan Watson wanted back in 2009, when we decided to try to go for uh, implementation, implementation of the Dues of the Payment Ordinance, the city set up a land bank instead of a land trust. And, and that, along with the, the policies already promulgated by the Wayne County Treasurer, resulted in auctions that were heavily weighted toward investors and away from people who wanted to actually own the properties, even if they were living in the properties at the time. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, a federal investigation was launched uh, of the city of Detroit's practices of taking over a quarter of a billion dollars in the hardest hit fund that was supposed to be used to keep people in their homes and to rehab homes and for mortgage forgiveness, which could have, which included tax foreclosure forgiveness, and has spent the lion's share of this money on demolition. Demolition of homes that could have been saved, but because now the demolition contractors are charging by the cubic foot and not by the square foot. It's in their interest to tear down houses without inspection, particularly the, the larger homes, the three-bedroom brick basement, two-car garage type homes, rather than the little shacks, because they get up to 20, 25, even $30,000 for removing these structures, so there's no incentive for them to do anything else. In fact, one of the largest demolition contractors, Homerick, is also in charge of shutoffs of residential water, which makes those homes unlivable, and they again become candidates for demolition at taxpayer expense. Also subsequent to this time, the federal investigation has now reached the grand jury phase, and I'm sure that uh, the land bank, which has swollen what, since its inception from a five-member body to now over a 125-person bureaucracy, with many at the top getting six-figure salaries to perpetrate itself and, and to continue to deny, as we have been denied now for the last two years, uh, a fair hearing, a public hearing, as, as to how this implement, or this ordinance or can be implemented, which is still on the books, while at the same time, the city is proposing other ordinances to take away community development block grant funds and NOF funds that were intended to use, be used for neighborhood development and give them to developers to build uh, new apartment buildings where the rent structures will be uh, such that the people who will be displaced will never, ever be able to get back. How do they do this? The federal government allows two criteria uh, to be used. Uh, the first is federal census tracts, and that can be done for the city itself. Uh, the second is what they call, and this is where uh, Detroit's falling down in less than a million people uh, really had an impact, what they call metropolitan statistical areas. This means that 
when, when they figure out what is a low income rent, they don't figure out Detroit and, and Detroit's population by federal census tracts. They use the metropolitan statistical area, which includes Detroit, Livonia, and Warren. So when you use that indicator, uh, you get a low income rent of uh, some, somewhere between a family income of forty-five to fifty-three thousand dollars, but we know that the average of, of amount that fa a family is making in Detroit is less than twenty-seven thousand dollars. So we know that it's mathematically impossible uh, for this to have any success, and yet uh, the trend continues as with the tax increment finance areas of robbing poor people to subsidize upper income and rich people, i.e. what's going on uh, with the development downtown presently. Uh, as I said to the uh, people at Detroit Future City, and I have a copy of their plan as well as uh, the black plan that was uh, chaired by Dan Gilbert, as long as the poor subsidize the rich, they will always be poor. You're a tough act to follow, Gene. I'm going to try it. <laughs> I like a man who can be so passionate and then go back to eating the enchilada like that is also an excellent discount for that. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Pappendorf, or as David likes to call me, Pappendorf, correctly. Uh, I'll use it as my pet name tonight because right now I find myself in this role of trying to be a bridge between some of the activists and some of the conversations that are happening, like in this room and also trying to translate that into a language that the mayor and the county treasurer and the county executive don't feel like they're at a punk rock concert getting bottles and cans and sticks thrown at them. It's a, it's a tough job, as many people in this room know. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure we're doing it very well. But uh, I, uh, uh, I'm gonna deliver remarks in this room that are very similar to remarks that I delivered a little bit earlier today in a different room. This is also a very powerful, powerful room a few hours ago, I was in the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago's Detroit branch, okay, and I was invited there because there was a convening of CDFI organizations, which are a banking institution, you know, they're community development financial institutions that have been created to help be this bridge, I think, kind of a closer to the neighborhood lending institution that can take larger risks, the concept, you know, build some of those gaps after 2008 and trying to steer away from people lending money that might create a problem for the, the, the borrower. Um, and the reason I was invited to that room is that I've been talking more and more publicly about the outrageous state of tax foreclosure in the city and some of the solutions that could actually happen, I think, to make the tax foreclosure problem go away. I won't say quickly, because I don't think it can really happen quickly, but on the order of a few years, rather than what we're currently doing, which is where this problem just seems like it's going to roll on as far as you can see into the future. And so these remarks are remarks that I gave to the CDFI group. I'm going to give them here um, as well. And I will say that it's actually it's very personally satisfying to be able to be in two rooms from the Federal Reserve Bank and its fancy marble floors and into this awesome room here. It's great to be able to have the, the same message and hopefully be a little bit of a bridge. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to give some background on the tax foreclosure problem, and I'm also going to describe exactly what's going on with tax foreclosure this year. Um, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to presume, I'm going to try to tell the story quickly, and I'm going to presume that people have no knowledge of the situation for the most part, although I know some of you in the room are, are versed in this, um, but I think it will help us all be on the, on the same page. Um, and I'm also going to describe, in addition to the problem, some potential solutions that I think are achievable in the city right now if we can muster the political willpower to do them. Um, so as organizations, foundations, investors, CDFIs, the city itse itself, work to put millions of dollars into the city's neighborhoods now, in addition to downtown, because I think that there's a general awareness that 
even if you take the most cynical stance and just view it as optics. The mayor, the current administration, don't want bad optics, so they want to be working well in Detroit's neighborhoods. They get that for the last X years, stuff has been happening downtown, and it's not been spreading out. So, um, the uh, everyone is familiar with the mortgage foreclosure crisis that's been discussed earlier uh, this session as well. But far fewer people are aware of the tax foreclosure crisis that really followed on uh, on the back of this. And the graph on the screen right now, okay, this is this is tax foreclosures in Detroit from 2002, which is the first uh, year that we had a tax foreclosure auction under our current law, the Public Act 123, and the growth, the explosion, really, of tax foreclosures uh, reaching their peak in 2015. And you can see that this growth is really centered on um, 2008, people defaulting on their mortgages. And the way that this has been put together in Michigan is we have the most aggressive tax foreclosure law in the country. If you fall two years behind on your property taxes, you get a tax foreclosure notification, and then the Wayne County Treasurer takes and sells your property at the end of the third year. Um, the way that this works out financially um, between the city and the county I think it's really important for people to understand because I think it's, it speaks to the why of why has this problem been allowed to mushroom and continue without anybody doing anything to serious to stop it. So you pay your property taxes to the city of Detroit directly until they're one year late. And when your taxes are one year late to the city of Detroit, Wayne County borrows the money from the bond market that the city did not collect and it pays that money to Detroit. So Detroit gets made whole. Even if it doesn't collect the property taxes, it gets the money paid to them, and Detroit says, I'm cool. Then Wayne County becomes the debt collector. The treasurer becomes the debt collector. They put 18% interest on the late tax payments. They put fees and penalties. And so people who catch up on the property tax payments late, all their payments together add up for a nice surplus for Wayne County. And if you don't pay after three years, they auction your property to get as much back as they can for it. And what that's added up to, show, show two things here. Um, I'm sorry, sometimes I feel like the, the maestro of terrifying maps that nobody knows how to do anything about, but um, what, what you're seeing on this map here is every red parcel of property in Detroit is a property that has been tax foreclosed and sent to the auction since 2002, the first year of the auction under our, our current law. So this is about one in three properties in the city. Um, this is about 145,000 properties this has happened to. You know, when you zoom in a little bit further, you see that there are definitely spaces between these properties, but this is something that is absolutely everywhere. Um, and I'm sure many people in this room have stories of either being next to or living through tax foreclosure because um, in Detroit over the last 15 years, it's just been something that's happened. It's a, it's a, it's a part, of, uh, part of life. Now, one interesting uh, facet when you look at this map is you can clearly see defined just by the absence of foreclosures, the kind of greater downtown, midtown area. And I think that this really helps speak to how it's even possible for some otherwise thoughtful people who participate in Detroit's business opportunities and our investors and trying to make a dollar and trying to do good by the city, don't even have a consciousness that this is an issue that's been happening all around it. It just, it just does not touch that, that greater downtown, um, midtown area. So I mentioned um, how the county has been generating a surplus from these late tax payments. And I, I want to show you a, a quick graph here. And I know that this is really small on the screen, so you've got to forgive me. I'm going to tell you the important parts here. Actually, we'll stand for this. Okay, so this is back to 2002. This is when we started tax foreclosure and auctioning and auctioning the properties that I showed on the map. And this is through 2015. Now. Roughly speaking, okay, and I'm not a municipal bond person, I'm not a county finance person uh, professionally. If I get any of this slightly wrong, you know, somebody help correct me. And I've had many conversations with people at the county and other folks around this issue to let me know that this is indeed the shape of what's happening. There's little blue bars here every year, which is what the county budgeted that it would need to pay out to the cities that weren't collecting all their property taxes. And the county, in order for the county to break even, they would need to get this blue bar back, okay? So if they made this much money back from people paying late, they'd be good. The red bar is what they actually brought in between late taxes, penalties, interest, fees, and the auction. 
And so I know these numbers are small, but what you're looking at here is actually greater than $100 million in surplus on these years. So each year, from the late taxes and the auction, the county is generating a surplus, which they could reinvest in foreclosure prevention they, and property maintenance. They could spend it to make it easier to pay. They could spend it to do better outreach door to door. They could spend it to, to secure and maintain foreclosed properties that are vacant right now. But what, they've, what has been happening, okay, and I want, to, I want to say this very carefully because this is the part of trying to be like a mediator between different views. The county is not in great financial shape right now either. They just, they were in a consent agreement until, when was it, within the last year. And, and, and that, as we know in Michigan, is usually like the first step towards emergency management and, uh, and bankruptcy. And nobody really wants to see that happen because there'd be similar issues. People wouldn't get their pensions and retirement funds and there'd be other um, you know, gap, gaps in, in county service. So during that period, um, they recognized that they had all these surplus delinquent tax revenues in a, in, a, in a fund that they could use. And when Warren Evans talked about the county getting out of its financial difficulty and actually generating a surplus, the surplus they talked about is the money that came from late taxes and foreclosure. And the big, they put a couple hundred million dollars into the fund and it was a really big one-time arrangement. But if you look at the county's uh, financial projections for the next few years, they note that they're expecting to bring in $30 million from delinquent surpluses from delinquent tax funds. And so it's on the, on the page that to stay in good shape with the state and not go back into a consent agreement the county is essentially relying on Detroiters and other communities in Wayne County to pay their taxes late and then needing to auction the properties so that it avoids bankruptcy. And the reason that's important is because that being the case, until that's really kind of like laid out there and it's addressed by the county and we kind of have a, a catharsis over it, it means, oh, and I hate this because I can, I can just feel them saying, don't say this, Jerry. It, it, it means that the county's not fully incentivized to to stop foreclosure from happening. Okay. I know, I know, they, I know they say it the other way, and I, I get it. But it just, it's, it's, it's unfortunately the the case. Um, so, all right. Um, and for, uh, I'll also say in this too. So, okay, big dynamic is after two thousand and eight, the mortgage foreclosure crisis. The city did not properly reassess property values downwards to match the the actual reality of the real estate market in Detroit. Um, there is currently a lawsuit in the courts uh, where the ACLU and the NAACP are suing both the city and the county over this. And for those who are, are interested, because that, it's very compelling, it seems pretty clear cut that if you're gonna take homes from people with the fastest, strictest tax foreclosure policies in the country, that if the property taxes aren't properly assessed, and certainly if they're assessed higher than you than you should have been uh, paying, that there's an issue there with having these homes taken. Personally, it seems fairly clear cut. The way that it's described where there's maybe wiggle room is that people have like, what, two weeks in February where they can re uh, request their own reassessment. It's not, it's not a week, a few days, <laughs> depends on the year. I think they extended it like two weeks this year. Short notice. Short notice, yes. Um, and. Um, and there's always this, the, the county and the city tend to, to uh, and the state, frankly, tend to kind of play off each other of who's responsible. So if you ask the city, why don't you stop tax foreclosure, they say it's a county uh, policy, the county does it. And you ask the county, they say, well, that's a state thing, we just do what we're supposed to. And then if you ask the state, they say, well, that's just Detroit, being Detroit again. You know, we get, you know, we, we get how that works out. So you get this um, cir circle of accountability that really does not play out there. And it's similar with that, the argument about the overassessed taxes, because the county says the city gives us the assessments. The city says uh, you can, you know, go and request a, a reassessment. Um, so, okay, so it's 2002, 150,000 tax foreclosures, large, scary numbers, about one in three properties in the city. Um, let me jump to this year. So. So to bring us up to the present quickly, okay, we're looking at the next tax foreclosure auction starting September 5th, so about seven weeks from now, and the treasurer will be auctioning about 8,000 um, properties at that auction. About half of them are occupied, 
Okay, so we're looking at about 4,000 homes. It's probably a little bit less than that right now because the homes tend to go vacant over time. Um, so maybe we're looking at like, you know, 3,300, 3,500 homes. But we're at a point in Detroit where with the internet being what it is, we got what, 2 billion people on Facebook right now. Um, three years out of the bankruptcy, people paying attention in the city, lots of very well-intentioned policies to invest in neighborhoods, all of this. We're somehow still in a place where we can do something as barbaric as, as knowingly put a few thousand occupied homes into this auction and make them available to the highest bidder. Um, the uh, Loveland, as a, as a mapping and, and research firm, has, has tried to get insight. I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about these things because I feel like we've been kind of tracking this and trying to do something good for years now. It's just become untenable that the, the local government still has these policies. Um, I, I, want to, I do want to show you two, uh, quickly show you two research projects um, that we did trying to understand the impact of tax foreclosure on occupied homes. So one project we did, and David, if I, sh if I share links with you afterwards, can stuff be emailed around to attendees or is it okay? Um, we, we did one project that uh, visited um, about 6,000 occupied homes that were put into the tax foreclosure auction in 2014. We went back one year later to, to look at the homes, and this was a visual inspection. Um, and Gene talked about the blight elimination uh, program in this report. Um, this is something I, I'd like to talk more about because our company did work on the, the initial survey to collect data about blight in Detroit. This was a, you know, citywide, we used a, a, a mobile phone app that we created and hired about 200 Detroiters that literally visited every single property in the city. So it was a photograph and then it was entering what you were seeing. Was the house occupied? Was it unoccupied? What condition was the home in? Etc. So I'm very familiar with some of the data inputs that go into the, the policy decisions. So we, we used the same tool to, to visit the 6,000 occupied homes that went into the auction. We did this two years in a row so we could actually compare what was going on with the property one year to the next year. And what we found was not good. This was not, you know, this was not um, going into properties to assess the internal condition, but we found um, of the 6,000 homes, a thousand of them were already clearly visually dilapidated in the way that you can see it from the street dilapidated. You know, not knowing what's going on inside, but just visually knowing that these were occupied homes that were tax auction, and then an event had occurred that caused people to leave, either because they didn't own it anymore or because somebody evicted them, and then seeing the physical effects of that. Um, the following year, we tried to take this a step further, or we, we did. Uh, our colleague Jackie uh, lives, lives in Morningside uh, and visited and door knocked on every single occupied home that went through the tax auction. And she did this just, just a couple months after the auction. And the, the point of the visit was to say hello and to ask if any contact had been made with the buyer and what that contact was. And then Jackie also asked for a little more personal detail about what the situation was that led up to the, the foreclosure. So I know this is a little far away, but we found a few categories of recurring situations. So a uh, large percentage of the people in Morningside had already received eviction notices. So these are, you know, investor buys the home, comes in, gives the eviction notice. There's not a conversation about, do you want to rent, do you want to buy, do you want to stay? And we tried to connect the outcome to the taxes owed and to the purchase price of the home. And so these, these are just heartbreaking when you see, you know, this, this family had a health problem, owed $12,000 in change in taxes, and then the buyer purchased it for $3,000 and then issued a, a tax foreclosure notice. And as, as you can see from the photos, these are, these are very nice homes too. This is not the stereotype of what sometimes people think, like, oh, that must just be a shaft that that's happening to. We did similar things chronicling the stories of people who were just moving. So some people, when they found out they don't own it anymore, just get on the go. It's not a situation you can deal with the stress. You don't know what's gonna happen next. So even if you don't receive an eviction notice, you take up and leave. And then there's also the process whereby former owners of properties then become renters. And there's uh, the census data recently showed that Detroit has become a majority rental city for the first time, I think since the 1950s. Some of you guys probably know better than I do on that, but I think that was the, the last time that there was that kind of situation. Um, okay, so.
so what can we do this year about the occupied homes at the auction? So this is a really interesting question. I, I, um, knowing that the county has the financial issues that they have, meaning that they're on the edge of potential insolvency and bankruptcy themselves, um, and knowing that the, that the treasurer's office clearly doesn't want to sell occupied homes, nobody wants to do that, it's really like a dollar, it comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, I wrote an op-ed that was published in the Free Press last Friday, which wondered if we might do something like the grand bargain during Detroit's bankruptcy. I would love to hear your opinion on this, because by the grand bargain I mean specifically um, the money that was put up by the foundations to save the art at the DIA. So if you remember, the, the creditors wanted to liquidate the art to make the money back that was owed to them. And there was a big effort, it was a very unique effort. Um, a number of foundations came together and they put up, it was, it was hundreds of millions of dollars in this case with the art, and the creditors backed off and said, okay, fine, we'll look for money somewhere else, that'll, that'll satisfy us. So what do, the, what do the finances actually look like when you're talking about 4,000 occupied homes? On average, they owe about $6,000 in back taxes. And so if you're the Wayne County Treasurer, you're really trying to collect $24 million, is what your job is. If you're just view, viewing it purely financially, that's what you're looking for. So is it possible to find foundations and local corporate philanthropy that could step forward with $24 million to front to the Treasurer and then work with occupants to enter buyback programs and pay the back taxes over time to become the owners? It's certainly possible, you know, the, and the kind of thinking there is like if you can save art, you can save the homes. You know, the dollar amount is less, the benefit to Detroit's neighborhoods is, is clearer, and if you put that money up, you can actually make it back, too, as the financial lender. It doesn't have to be a donation. You put the $6,000 down, and then you work with the occupant to, to pay that back over time, to get your money back, or, or a large part of it back. Uh, one thing that I'm... Uh, I'm very excited to have been a part of over the last couple of years is in, in trying to give greater insight to, to who is going into foreclosure and to make it actually possible to think about taking homes out. Um, last year we were able to work directly with the treasurer's office on a door-to-door -door effort which was door knocking, handing out foreclosure prevention information, and also interviewing people who were living in foreclosures. So we, we were able to administer an optional interview and from those interviews, we just learned the most amazing information that I think it just really revolutionized how we help people get out of tax foreclosure because it went from like all these stereotypes about who's in there and what's in there, and it suddenly became broken down to, and at the household level, half the people going into the foreclosure auction are renters. These days, they're not even responsible for paying the property taxes. They pay rent to a landlord, and the landlord is walking away from the property for some reason. And to reach those people and do something about that, you don't get them on a payment plan. There's nothing for them to pay. They need an entirely different solution. About a third of the people that get to the auction are owner-occupants. So they own the property outright, and they've been struggling. They're behind on their property tax payments, and they were the owner. And then the remaining group is a mixture of family members of deceased former owners, and this is very, very common in the city. You find, you know, family had owned the property for a long time, and there's a confusion about how to transition the chain of title or the ownership from a family member, a grandmother, or a parent to the, um, to the, to the children. Um, so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of scam land contracts where people think they're buying a house, but they're paying to somebody who doesn't really own it or is, or, you know, is otherwise not paying the taxes. And then you do have, and we have less detail about this, but you, know, you do have a lot of what we'll call informal occupants. So these are either what you would consider squatters or they could be like the, you know, more like the, the nuisance abatement contractors where they're putting work into the house and there's kind of a variety in there. But, but by knowing the situation uh, at the household level, it changes how you can approach this problem completely. Because right now I think a lot of people are hesitant to like lean forward into this because the stereotype is that they're either all burned down properties or they're all just very sick, very, very poor people that you wouldn't even have the first idea of how to interact with. And as you start to fill out these cases of like, no, that's, that's Jenny, this is Jenny's situation. If you want Jenny in the house, this is what needs to happen. There's a growing awareness that we can do more to get the occupied um, properties out. The, um, you know, I'd love to hear people think this is an effective argument. Uh, 
the, the thing that I keep bringing up in all of this is how the tax foreclosure auction works against all of the largest goals articulated by Mayor Duggan, which, which to me, I, I, I break it down as, uh, thing number one, he says, grow the population. So if you are foreclosing and auctioning homes that have people in them, and then they go vacant, that doesn't help grow the population. In fact, Detroit came very close to showing population growth for the first time in a long time, the last, this year's um, census mini update. Midterm, yes, it's, I think I said we lost like 4,000 over the, the last uh, year, I believe is what it was. And, but if you look at the year before, the, the prior year, we sold 5,000 occupied homes at the auction. So if we weren't doing that every year, would we have had population growth? I can't say directly, but we're getting closer to it if we would stop doing dumb stuff like this. Um, goal number two, eliminate the blight and vacancy. This is like such a, people hate hearing this too, but uh, having worked on the citywide survey and knowing what the attitude has been towards keeping that work going, I remember when, when we first did the door-to-door -door occupancy mapping and blight mapping, the goal was let's keep this going with like a new snapshot every year so we can see what progress is. And I remember as soon as we started to make like the second snapshot, it was like maybe we shouldn't be tracking this because there's a lot of properties that are still going vacant. And from the best that I can tell right now, there are, there are more vacant homes in Detroit today than there were in 2014 when this demolition program started. And it's just kind of mind-boggling. Mean, it's just so counter to the narrative. Frankly, Detroit is like a magi magician. I don't know where we keep getting all these homes. <laughs> 50,000 here, and some, you know, 75,000 here. Would you say 25,000 homes wrecked in the in the 70s? And then what was the other? 65,000 mortgage. 65,000 mortgage foreclosure. 145,000 tax foreclosure. I don't know. It's, it's hard to get your mind around. But the but blight is, is still growing, and you can really think of tax foreclosure right now as the blight pipeline in the city because all the blight is running through it. Either it's a correlation that somebody's walked away from it or it's being caused by it when you sell somebody's occupied home. Um, and then the, I'm not sure how many people here saw the, uh, the Mackinac Policy Conference uh, conversation that the mayor had. It's on YouTube. I would highly recommend watching it because it was a really interesting talk. He just kind of, he like jumped right into that audience and was like, here's the deal. Detroit's got a lot of his problems because we had racist housing policies. And he kind of talked, he talked through, it was, a, it was a similar talk to some of your talk. It certainly wasn't all of it. But he talked about redlining and he talked about the Federal Housing Administration explicitly saying you can't get mortgages in mixed race areas. And just all this, you know, like, wow, oh, that was the government language in the 70s? It was kind of crazy to see. But he talked about it and he, he put it up for everybody. But he sort of, uh, and, then, and what it added up to for for him is that the, the slogan for the city's development moving forward is one city for all of us was the, was the encapsulation. And the notion there is that no longer would Detroit push out black or poor people. And he talked a lot about trying to keep affordable housing in the city and other kinds of programs. He did mention, and again, I want to be careful because I, I, this doesn't mean that I, I, I know these guys can do great things. They've got the opportunity to do to do great things, and there's just some blind spots, and there's, there's a lot to be done, and, it, and it's hard. But that conversation conspicuously jumped over mortgage foreclosure and tax foreclosure. It kind of jumped right to the land bank auctioning, you know, uh, a few homes and side lots, and it kind of missed this this thing that's still happening right now. Um, so, keeping on the solutions tip, um, you know, I, I think as a as, as a policy, as something to advocate for as a way to begin drying up the tax foreclosure. I think that it's, it, it is a very, um, it's something everybody can get behind if we just decide to stop selling occupied homes at the tax auction, would be a really good start. Um, it's inhumane, it has bad effects on the property, it, it decreases the population, it increases blight, it pushes out poor people, it does everything against what the, what the mayor's um, big platforms are for. Um, I, uh, I don't think that doing that once is something that will systematically solve the tax foreclosure uh, problem because in, uh, in my next in a series of, of scary overwhelming maps, um, what you're seeing here 
every parcel of property that's, that is colored in yellow is one year to two years behind on its property taxes, and everything that's orange is subject to foreclosure in 2018. And so we're looking at, right after the tax auction, another 50,000 tax foreclosure notices going out to Detroit properties for 2018. And that's, this seems like an incredibly overwhelming uh, thing to, to work on. And, and it is, but I, I would actually put forward that um, there's something very affordable and common sense and community oriented that we could do if we choose to do it. Um, that we start doing this year, which is rather than just putting the yellow tax foreclosure baggie on everything, which is, um, I'm sure people in the room are familiar with this, if you're not, the way the county notices you for foreclosures, there's a, like a little yellow shopping bag, and a little yellow tote bag. Let's see. It looks like, it looks like this. Um, they put it on your front door with tape, or they, they stake it into a vacant lot, um, and inside of that baggie is really small type, really hard to read, uh, legal legalese information. You know, that you've been foreclosed, and you know, here's some of your options, but here's the county's right to do this. And, and as you open that, it does not really help you connect to anything that might fit your situation to help you avoid it, and the county doesn't bother or does not yet really open a ticket on each of these foreclosures and try to understand who and what is going through it and why. And the reason that that's important, if you can imagine, I should also say, the way this currently works is that the, the county pays a, a servicing company out of Macomb County a few million dollars every year to, to do this job. And so we're missing a massive opportunity to hire Detroit residents to actually go and make contact with the people on property that are entering foreclosure, give the legal notification, but also give understandable information about how you can get on a payment plan and how to figure out if you uh, could get a poverty tax uh, exemption or if you apply for Step Forward or any of these other programs, and also take the time to interview people because if you actually talk and open up a case on a tax foreclosure, you'll know pretty quickly which people plan and can make the payments and are like, sorry, yeah, 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 this is embarrassing, get out of here. And which people are like, I, I can't, I, I need help, this is my situation, this is what will apply to me. And the people who go, WTF, I'm a renter, what's going on, what, is this, what, is this, what does it mean for me? There's a whole different set of interactions. And if, if we were to actually go and visit all the tax foreclosures on behalf of the treasurer this fall, we would be more than, we'd be a year out in front of next year's tax auction and we'd be matching people to programs to get them out of foreclosure. And if you keep that up, that brings so much community engagement to the problem and so much support to the problem that next year's auction is gonna be a, a ton smaller. And if there are any occupied homes that go into it, we'll know who they are and we'll know what to do to get them out. So the, the basic premise is, is stop selling the occupied homes and then do the notification and interaction with residents much, much differently than it's done before. And I, I know, I think this is, People can, can rightly be concerned about the data and who, who collects the data, where does the data exist, and, and what's done with the data. There are ways to bring community engagement and, and data tracking and collection together in, in ways that that should be done now. And the only reason they're not is there just needs to be a little, little flip of the imagination and the solutions need to be presented to the, uh, the powers that be in a way that delivers a victory for them as well. And I know that's something that, again, I'm trying to get better at crossing that bridge myself, where we can both point out the problems that exist, but also try to package them in such a way where it's like, oh gee, treasurer, you know, I couldn't help but notice that you're, you know, currently balancing the county's budget off of people paying taxes late and the interest is crazy high. And, you know, a mayor like, the demolition program's got a lot of heat on it right now and it looks like it's not, you know, totally stopping homes from going vacant. That's not your fault entirely. Like these conversations, right, this goes back forever. Not forever, but for, for a long, long time. So how does it get packaged where we can take like the righteous anger that people in this room have and should have about things that aren't being done and then holds it out in a way where 
we're not just kind of hitting each other with like sticks of we should do this and, and we should do that. And that's far easier for me to say because I'm newer to the conversation. I can only imagine the things that you've been through and, and felt and gotten into in city council over those those years. Um, so, so at this point, I'm going to stop yapping, but I, hopefully that helps introduce where we're at tax foreclosure. And really, I want to help stir in like what are what are some things that we can actually do to make it go away. And those are a couple, couple of ideas um, to stir in. So um, I'm, I feel honored to be in this room. Thank you for the invitation. Questions. Uh, I did want to say to Jerry, I'm far less uh, optimistic than he is. I know that on my block uh, there's vacant houses, but my street will be swept this year because it is an election year. But uh, beyond that, uh, anyone have any questions for any of our panelists? I think uh, you know this is something that affects us all, and as we're in the midst of uh, you know. Uh, Quite frankly, you know, what I would argue is, you know, a, a coordinated plan to rid the city of its poor population, uh, especially its black population, right? And there are various different means, despite the rhetoric in which this has been done historically. So I think it's a really important time to talk about it, and I appreciate uh, if anyone has any questions, I will come to you. Uh, yeah, I have uh, a short comment, and I have a question for either one of you to answer. Uh, one of my short comments is that the first speaker, when you talked about the, the white flight, um, could you give some back economic background to what was going on then? And the reason why I'm asking that, I'm going to give a short comment to people that have lived here, especially black people, that have lived here, because I've, I've been living here since 1948. And one of the things, Detroit has been like two cities, east side and west side. And one of the things in the uh, late 40s and, and the late late 40s all the way till, all the way until the uh, riots, up to the riots, because these seminars seem to be like, you know, pointed for uh, direction is that, and this is not an anti-Jewish statement, this is just a point of reality. On the west side of Detroit, you can trace the residencies of black people based on the places that the Jewish people left. Because when, when I was growing up in the early 50s, the inner city was not a bad slogan. It just meant the middle of the city. Um, and, and much of that was good housing. Um, Central High School was mostly Jewish. Mumford High School was mostly Jewish. McKenzie High School was mostly Jewish. And those were very good neighborhoods, especially over by Central, because there were a lot of two-family and four-family flats. They were well-maintained. But as the Jewish people moved closer to 8 Mile, past Myers, the blacks moved in. And it's been that way up until the riots. So the white flight thing really uh, was not, it had nothing to do with the, the riots. The riots might, may have exacerbated it a little bit, but it had been going on. I had noticed that it had been going on ever since I was a kid in the, in the 50s. So maybe you could speak to the economics of what was going on then when they start talking about white flight, because I'm really tired of people talking about that when I, when I witnessed these neighborhoods changing all through the 50s. Uh, okay, I'm getting to check the question. I want to ask, ask my question, so, so I'd be, so I be too. The other, the other question I have, hold that, that's one question. The other question I have for either one of you, I've noticed, for example, the apartment building uh, the, the high-rise apartment building on uh, Shane and Larn, which used to be senior citizens and low-income people, uh, it was renovated, and I think Gilbert bought it, not for sure who bought it, but it was renovated, and also the town apartments over here by the bus depot, depot were renovated, and all the low-income like, how are they doing this? Because I thought those were HUD, HUD places, and I would like to know what's the history and how are they able to do this? Because Gilbert tried to buy 
the uh, Martin Luther King apartments and it was stopped. So why were they able to buy those but not this? And the last, the last, my last question is this illegal financial review board that Snyder instituted, how long will they be there? And what what is the best way to tackle what you were saying about stopping them from foreclosing people that are already in home? <laughs> All right. Well, so here, let me just pass the mic so you can answer those uh, very simple questions. Well, I think I, I can take on your, your first question and then I might pass it off for, for some of the others. Um, but I actually, my work is on the Bagley neighborhood in Northwest Detroit, which was a Jewish neighborhood until uh, the mid 60s. And so, um, yeah, you're absolutely right that white flight began um, broadly, not just talking about Detroit's Jewish population, but broadly began after World War II, and, and that's something that um, Tom Segrew's book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, if you haven't read it, you should read it. That's the big argument in the book, right, is that white flight did not start after the rebellion. Uh, 350,000 people left Detroit prior to the rebellion, and that had a lot to do with the rebellion, right? Um, but yeah, there was this trajectory of Jewish out migration from Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, which was the, the uh, what, Arnold Hirsch calls the first ghetto, right? So, so parts of cities where uh, middle class blacks and elite blacks resided alongside the poor, and there were black institutions and you know all of that. So that's Black Bottom, Paradise Valley. That was a Jewish neighborhood before the Great Migration, um, briefly, and then uh, Jews migrated. Well, once the Great Migration started, they migrated to the Russell Woods area that you mentioned uh, near Central High School. Um, which then became a black neighborhood, then Fitzgerald, then Bagley, um, and now even on out to Southfield. So there's this Jewish black trajectory in Detroit that also existed in Brooklyn um, and a lot of other cities. But yeah, you're absolutely right um, that white flight started right after World War II. Um, and the economics were really that the, the federal government was subsidizing companies to move manufacturing outside of central cities, right? So that, again, we have this federal policy that's being rolled out by Eisenhower, uh, the Eisenhower administration, to move factories, to decentralize factories outside of central cities, right? So the best jobs were going to the suburbs and other states. Um, and this started before then, right? Like Ford was moving plants, GM, uh, uh, Lordstown, what was that, 20, 1920? Yeah, the Rouge was a really one of the first big suburban plants. Um, and then you have plants moving to Ohio and stuff. So this, this process was really underway uh, about the time that the Great Migration on, like, set in. Uh, so as soon as blacks start moving north for opportunity, the opportunity starts to starts to trickle out. Uh, but it really accelerated after World War II. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's all I've got on that one. Um, I know there was a question about emergency management. Oh uh, yeah, I can answer your last question. And then maybe he could do with the second one. <laughs> um, the Financial Review Commission is supposed to uh, end their control over the city January 1st, 2018, because uh, the city was under uh, terms of presenting a balanced budget three years in a row. When they did that last month, however, uh, anybody who ever goes to uh, any of the meetings of the Financial Review Commission, which meets on the last Monday of every month at one o'clock on the first floor of the old GM building. The old what? The old General Motors building. Yeah, now called Cadillac Place. Okay. Right. Uh, and, and, and anyone who goes online, and you can go online and uh, Google Financial Review Commission, uh, Arm of the State Treasurer, uh, you, you'll see that they are endeavoring uh, to make their own laws about whether or not they'll let the city go back to control of the elected officials January 1st, or whether certain sections of their uh, control over the city might actually go on to 2024. And this is because um, well, I, I don't want to be too cynical, but uh, so they can keep stealing our pensions. 
I don't remember the second question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was a tax foreclosure question, or was it connected to the, the finance? <laughs> journalism that can really keep following a story for a long time in town. And I, I will say there's there's a great story about the tax foreclosure finances that came out recently that I would highly, highly recommend by Bridge Magazine, which has been doing some excellent work in this area. And they, they took the time to really peel apart the county finances and the amount of surplus they made from the interest, the late, the late payments, and, and the auction, and to put rigor around showing that. They're like, yes, this is, this is what's happening right now. Now, how those county finances actually connect to the city finances, and why is, I would guess there's something in there, which is why the city is not more vocal about this. I am not an expert at this. I do not know whether that's based on relationships, that people from the city and the county know each other and have things that go back in time. I don't know if it's because of how the city's finances and the way that the county fronts it money that it doesn't collect are all tied together. I don't know how Wayne County's finances weren't investigated during the Detroit's bankruptcy, because if you have a county that's near bankruptcy, when you just have the city go through bankruptcy, this seems strange. I generally feel like people don't really know what Wayne County is, and I'll just say that I'm, I'm sort of not even at that level sometimes, I'm like, what, what is this thing? It's, in, it's integral to Detroit's existence, but it's unclear exactly how those two things are tangled together right now. At least it is for dopes like me. So I don't have a better answer other than I'm people who know and people who can research. I hope keep illuminating that because it doesn't totally make sense. Well, more point information on that. Point information on that. Yeah. If I understand correctly, uh, Mayor Duggan has assert, asserted that he has never supported a program that forced uh, lower income black people out in favor of higher income whites. Do you uh, see any way that's a defensible statement? I'm not sure it's uh, toward the uh, third speaker's emphasis on solutions. Are there institutions in the city that historically have or for the future could be enlisted to work on the kind of solutions that you're talking about? For example, the university, the state university, for example, or churches, or neighborhood groups, or uh, even business um, groups, community associations, or other community resources in terms of community institutions that could be enlisted to work with you and others who are concerned about this in other ways. Excellent questions. Uh, I'm going to pass and give you each a chance to respond as well. Uh, to, to your uh, first question uh, regarding uh, whether or not what Mayor Douglas said was a defensible statement, I, I can't fathom it as being uh, wholly genuine, you know, speaking about, you know, uh, tax workflow when uh, they're pressing the tax and, and fighting blight with, uh, when, when, when the city's policies actually make more blight. It kind of reminds me of uh, the graduates of uh, the Her uh, uh, Go Goebbels uh, School of Propaganda. Well, you don't tell small lies, tell big lies. And, can, and repeat them over and over and over again until they're accepted as fact. I, 
We are challenging the man, as we challenge the last man, to make good on their statements. And, and all, all we've had was a suspension of the working group where we were proposing solutions. And they have stonewalled us, including the city clerk, uh, uh, since November of last year. We can't even get a hearing. Now, the right to petition one's government uh, for redress of grievances is not just a constitutional right, but goes back to the Magna Carta over 800 years. Now, if King John couldn't pre prevent his lords from doing that, I don't know who uh, Janice Winfrey and uh, Mike Duggan think they are. Uh, to the second question uh, regarding solution, which kind of segues into what I was just talking about, and, and I don't want to cast aspersion on, on the idea of having foundations uh, put up money for, uh, uh, to prevent foreclosures of occupied properties. But foundations are creatures of corporations. And, and as I've said before, and I'll say again, uh, no amount of philanthropy, no matter how good intentioned or well endowed, can ever be an antidote for poor public policy. Never. It's never happened, never will. I would suggest that you go to the clerk's office uh, or, or, or go uh, to the uh, public access channel. Uh, it's different for uh, Comcast as it is for Ubers. And look at some of the hearings that the Detroit Association of Realtors has, has had before the city council with the mayor's representatives, Mr. Arthur Jemison, proposing our solutions, using the federal money from the uh, uh, hardest hit fund, which they were legally supposed to do using the, the public-private partnership, which they're so, so keen to keep extolling, of the assistance that the Detroit Association of Realtors uh, could provide in clearing titles, in, in, in uh, uh, providing assistance to uh, uh, people to not just stay in their homes, but to reoccupy and save homes from demolition uh, 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 to get the kind of assistance from the public sector and the private sector that we as realtors always do. Uh, uh, why they don't want to do this, our, our petition number is 2977, by the way, in case you want to call the mayor of city council and tell them about that. Uh, uh, I can only see as, as a disingenuous uh, effort, particularly during an election year, to raise their rhetoric while compounding their actions. I don't listen to what they say, I, I watch what they do. I'll talk very briefly because I think that uh, my colleagues have more to this, but I think that um, in terms of whether Duggan thinks he's pushing important people out or not, I, I think one thing that we haven't talked about today is city services. And so one thing that I would ask the mayor to reckon with is the, the notion that uh, neighborhoods that are slated for, let's not call it gentrification, even though that's what it is, let's say reinvestment, redevelopment, revitalization, renaissance, are neighborhoods that are targeted for massive, massive public investments, right? Um, yet the neighborhoods that we've been talking about today are DIY neighborhoods, do it yourself. They're, um, we're gonna roll out this program for y'all to purchase lights for your front yards, uh, since all the street lights are out. Or, um, hey, why don't we help you raise money for the local elementary school that might close next month, we're not sure. Um, or what are some of the other projects? Uh, the, the AmeriCorps patrols, right? So the city has been partnering, and Wayne State has been partnering with um, AmeriCorps on the Urban Safety Initiative. Which, this all sounds good on the surface, right? Getting residents to participate in neighborhood revitalization. And, and the volunteers are extremely well-meaning and it's getting some things done around the city, but at the same time, why are everyday black middle-class homeowners who pay $5,000 a year in taxes, or 4,000 or 3,000 a year in taxes, expected to go patrol their own streets with their own cars with a city magnet that the city bought them, 
you know, to go and do that. So to me, there's, there's two very different ways that Duggan has approached investments in the city. Um, some neighborhoods get massive investments, uh, you know, $430 million for the entertainment district being one of them. Um, and then, yeah, we're not really doing anything about um, adequate community policing or schools, right? So, like, uh, it's DIY in the neighborhoods and then it's investing in downtown. So I would, to me, that's an, yet one more uh, piece of evidence that, that the plan is really, because here's, here's why it matters, right? Like, who wants to buy a house in a neighborhood where you have to patrol your own streets, buy your own street lights, uh, dig out your own um, storm, Drain, right? That's another thing that's been going on where they're saying, well, you own the home in front of that storm drain, so you need to go and dig it out so the street doesn't flood. But that's city owned property, right? Or why should you have to pay $2,000 to get the tree cut down that's on the city owned property between the sidewalk and the street? Um, so nobody wants to buy a home in those neighborhoods. So when we talk about how to put these tax workforce properties back on the market, because that's another problem. Um, how are, how are we to do that if the neighborhood doesn't have services? So we, what, what we've done by eliminating services in black neighborhoods is just take those neighborhoods off the market, which makes it very, very hard to recover from some of these problems. I just want to float one thing, this will be the last thing I'll let Jerry close, but uh, you know, one of the analogies that I always uh, mention when Jerry and I talk about this is uh, New York, you know, what they call the plan shrinkage in the 70s, where they basically did urban renewal, but without funding anything, uh, and eviscerated neighborhoods uh, and shrank the city without putting any resources to it by simply cutting services to it. So now, if we have that historical example from New York and other cities where that took place, I know you don't want to, you know, uh, put motive in people's heads, but I mean, it seems like this is something that people that have led cities for years have done over and over again, despite claiming the opposite. Uh, and have done it very intentionally to clear broad swaths of land for redevelopment. So when you, when you are putting together these maps and you see all these maps, and you see particular areas that are being gutted and others that aren't in certain areas, how do you remain optimistic that people have uh, good intentions, despite you know the data that you're producing? Um, I guess the way that I'm trying to do it right now, and you've got to for, forgive me because this is, I don't even know if it has to do with what I believe or not. It's just how I see people respond when they get approached in different ways. And the, there's a saying in, in improvisational comedy, it's yes and. You know, somebody says something and it's yes and, whatever the prompt is, all right, yes and, I'm going to add to that. When I hear the administration say things like, I want to grow the population, I want to eliminate blatant and vacancy, and I want to have one city for all of us that doesn't push out poor people. I want to say yes and. So you want to catch that and say you just you said this, so here's how we can do this. And then you want to keep that up in a constructive way so that if there's a success, they can get capture some of the praise. And maybe if you keep doing it that way, they can actually start picking up what you're throwing down. Now, is that hard to do because there's some alternative motive in place? Maybe. I don't know. It, it, it does when you... I'm saying, is it difficult for you, though? Do you find yourself struggling to maintain kind of like that? that yes, like because, yes, be, yes, because, um, well, where are we at in time? I don't want to open up a whole bag of worms with, with, with the story, but I feel like it might be interesting to add that I'm, I'm like a weird, I don't want to say poster child for like, quote unquote, like new Detroit, but I'm, I'm pretty new to the city. I moved here in 2009, early 2009, and I came because I was interested. I was actually interested. I was like, I was hearing about $500 properties, and I was like, where did, Mommy, where did those come from? How do you make it? You know, how do I, yeah, how does, how does this work? Um, and then Detroit has just been such an education in so many different ways for me, and it's been going through like, oh, $500 house, cool. Okay, not that I really think it's cool, but it's like, it's, wow, what can you do with that? to going progressively down the rabbit hole to discovering all these things about how cities work and how they don't work and racial injustices and great migrations and the movement of Americans in and out of different places for jobs and then seeing what we're still doing today even though again, I, I keep bringing up blood I brought up the internet earlier things are so transparent right now you can 
press a button and you can look at a, a photograph of any location on the planet. I can tweet at like almost any political leader, and even our president might tweet back at me, for better or for worse these days, right? This is how, this is how tight and, and transparent everything is. And as somebody who believes in the power of the internet, as something that transparency can make something better, put it out there, open data, show the thing, and that'll make something better. To, to do that, and to have that environment, and then to not have things get better, is like wrong and, and embarrassing. And so for me personally now, it's just like, oh, for Pete's sake, to not curse. Um, I have to become an activist on some level that I wasn't previously, if it's not changing. Because what's the, what's, because then it's like, what the point? What's the point? People ask me, what do you do for a living? In our case, well, you know, we map cities so that people can like see what's really going on and make better policy decisions. And then you go home and you try to go to sleep and you're like, the policy here sucks. <laughs> and it's not persuading anybody. You, you want to become more active. So that's kind of a personal tangent that's maybe interesting. And I, hopefully Detroit continues to have that effect on people that do move here because I'm, I'm so grateful for the entire environment. It's a uh, set of situations that you would never ask for and are highly, clearly highly painful and still painful, but they, it, it brings an education upon you that I'm glad that I have because it's made me a more mature, caring person personally. Not that anybody really has that. Now for the, um, for the institutions, that could, could help here. I do want to say that if the county spent the money it made from tax foreclosure differently, it actually has the funds that it could spend to do this work on its own. And if, if you're having a conversation with someone about that, one example you might bring up is that our neighbors to the north in Genesee County, Flint Genesee County, they have a similarly scaled foreclosure problem relative to their city size. Now, their county treasurer, though, has made the decision not to sell occupied homes. She reinvests any surplus made from late taxes in maintaining foreclosed properties. So actually, they mow the grass, they secure the properties, and her county commissioners actually sued her fairly recently, saying, no, you need to put that money into our general fund for Genesee County so we can spend it on other stuff. And she said, no, I'm gonna spend it reducing foreclosures and maintaining homes. And the judge ruled in her favor and said this is the way the state law works out is the treasurer can spend it however they want. So you really shouldn't, again with respect, you really shouldn't believe Wayne County when they say that they can't do that. There is money there to, to do it, but for them to do it, you need to keep pointing it out, you need to keep saying, look at Genesee County, how about them, look at them. She, she did that, why can't you do that? To peel back the onion. Um, and I, on the foundation, the foundations are weird animals for everyone because they're generally they're weird in America. America has them, but most other countries don't because we we haven't liked taxes in the U.S. And so the, the foundations were kind of a, a tax loophole for really wealthy people, where the this is a simplification, but the federal government said, fine, you can keep all your money after you die and keep it like within your family, but you need to spend a certain amount each year on public benefit projects, broadly described, that otherwise might be addressed by, by taxes and, and social spending. And so, but they're not really regulated or transparent, as you might expect a government to be. So in Detroit, we have hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of, of foundational wealth, and currently the thinking of foundations is to spend it on like fashionable projects, I guess you'd say, place making, giant colorful pianos. Uh, I don't mean to, to knock it, but like, the, like, you know, kind of like more on the artworks, more on the wrong thing. And they tend to shy away from the things like the, the grand bargain and saving the DIA artwork. But maybe that's exactly where more of their money should be going, is to some of these structural things. And maybe if they were more, like if you could actually have people vote for how to spend foundation dollars and what kind of issues, even if it wasn't a formal legal vote, you might get Kresge or Kellogg or Ford's attention with that. And it says, well, rather than giving it out to these other neighborhood improvement projects, as we kind of define them as being fashionable, we are going to spend, uh, you know, $500 million on, on housing next year in, in this way, you know, and then they could they could have a healthier relationship in, in, in meeting people's needs. It's just a thought. They're, they're, they're far from perfect, but they are a huge resource and they're very powerful. And so the question is, and how do you shape them and their wealth and their power to meet deeper needs. So I think, I think there's a lot there. Um, so.
just have one note on uh, solutions. Uh, oh, I'll be real brief. Uh, the city of Richmond, California used eminent domain to seize foreclosed homes from banks and investors who weren't paying taxes or who weren't keeping up the home. So if the homes were blighted or they were a nuisance, the city seized them. Now that went to court. I think they lost an appeal. Um, and there are other cities doing that right now. But that's something that's been proposed for Detroit. Is that this, if the city or county really wanted to, they could, they could try to use eminent domain uh, to seize those properties and you know put them back in the market or put people in the home. Well, the community land trust that was in there, we don't get She's the president. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do her. Good evening. I uh, had the pleasure, I agree with what everybody said, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, Eugene and other realtors. We actually did get out into the neighborhood and go door to door for those that weren't paying their taxes, and they did implement the kiosk, and there were other things that were going on. But to your point, many of us are not slackers. Some of us are underemployed and don't have jobs. That's the elephant in the room about no jobs. That's part of the uh, problem that we have right there. And uh, uh, part about uh, gentrification, I think that's just fear. Because many of the young people in a the minute, they won't be able to stay downtown because they can't afford it. As soon as they want to have a baby, they can't because the schools aren't right. And many of them don't mind cleaning up the uh, trash. But these big swaths of land and all of this knowing where every door and everything is, that does create the atmosphere to amass the land for development, maybe not today, but for tomorrow. And what would motivate someone to have some money to go to somebody to ask for some money to keep you or me in my house? When it's 50 of us right there in that neighborhood and I can just not help you not give you a job and then put some trees out there or just wait or as you said a big balloon or something and it's just a matter of time so some of that 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 fear it seemed to be riding around all of a sudden everybody wants to talk about that riot or that rebellion they think it's easier to talk about rebellion rather than the other scary word that was one in 20 years before that wasn't it it was another one that they don't want to talk about, but they want to talk about it now instead of talking about how to employ the jobs and what we can do. Every time they do something in the city of Detroit, everybody comes from out of town. You said it yourself, they have people right here committed to the city. It's going to be realtors. You said our jobs are going away. We're going to be in the unemployment land. If they don't give us those houses in the land bank before they eat them up, but we don't rebigger ourselves, so as jobs for myself, I'm 70 years old, I'm still working. These young people, when they get tired of this, they won't stay here. I think we'll leave it right there. I think she said it uh, best. So I want to thank you all for coming on. If we could give uh, our panelists a hand. Uh, we're on the anniversary of Bastille Day, uh, the beginning of the French Revolution. Uh, I, I, I'd like to refer to the words of Jean-Jacques Rousseau from The Social Contract. Under bad governments, this equality is but an elusive appearance which only serves to keep the poor in misery and support the rich in their usurpations. In fact, Laws are always useful to those who have abundance and injurious to those who have nothing. From whence it follows that the social state is only advantageous to men when every individual has some property and no one has too much. Thank you.